If you have a Bible, I invite you to open up to Ephesians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, there are a few Bibles right in front of you. You can use one of those and open up to Ephesians chapter 3, or you can follow along in the bulletin. As we are going through the first half of the letter of Ephesians, the theme has been all about God's grace for our lives and for every sinner and for every aspect of our lives. Through Jesus Christ, God gives us his free gift of grace, his free gift of mercy and kindness and forgiveness for all our sins. And one of the main themes that I've been emphasizing for you as we go through the first three chapters of Ephesians is that in these three chapters, there's not a single command. And the reason I keep bringing that up is because I want you to remember it. And the reason I want you to remember it is because as Luther said a long, long time ago, we, we need to be reminded of the gospel every day because we forget it every day. And our natural instinct, even as Christians, even if we are people who believe in Jesus for his free gift of grace and mercy and forgiveness, is to come along and think, okay, but now I need to do more. Now I need to make sure I don't lose his love. Now I need to make sure he's always pleased with me or satisfied with me. And so what happens is we slowly through our actions and our our mentality and our attitudes begin to add things to the gospel. We begin to add things that we think we need to do in order to maintain God's grace. And the good news is that through this whole letter, Paul has just been basically been saying, I want to remind you over and over and over again that God loves you through Jesus freely. And so this morning, as we go through this section of scripture, I want to answer three questions. The first is what the gospel is. The second is who the gospel is for. And then the third is how do we respond to the gospel? So what the gospel is, who the gospel is for, and how we respond to the gospel. So in this section, Paul's letters can be kind of tricky to understand, right? He uses all the big words that he could possibly think of, and he just creates nothing but run-on sentences. So if you've ever had a friend who never finishes a story, anybody have a friend like that, where it's just like they start telling you something, and then they're in the introduction, and all of a sudden it's another story? And then there's new characters, and there's another story, and then you as the friend have no idea what's going on. Anybody got a friend like that? If you don't think you have a friend like that, you're that friend. And everybody else is putting up with you. All right? This is what Paul's doing in this section of Scripture. All right? So in verse 4, it says, For this reason I, Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, you notice there's a really big dash there. All right? And the reason is, is because based on the grammar and the flow of the thought, translators have realized Paul's about to tell another story. All right. So the first line is one idea. He doesn't pick that idea up again until verses 13 and 14. So verses 2 through 12 is Paul being your friend running on on a tangent. Right. So if you've ever been that person or have been in a meeting or a conversation where someone just veered off on a tangent, you're like, I don't know where this conversation is going anymore. That's what Paul is doing here. Now, for you and I, it's a very important tangent because it's a tangent all about the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what he's trying to do in the middle of all of this is explain to you and to me and the church in Ephesus why they can have hope in all circumstances. So line one, Paul is saying, I'm a prisoner for Christ Jesus on your behalf. That's not great. He's being persecuted. He's being arrested and imprisoned for doing what God has told him to do. Right? If you've ever done the right thing or done a good thing and then it didn't go well for you or nobody said thank you, right? We even have the saying in our culture, no good deed goes unpunished, right? Because we're just like, great, I try to do something nice, I try to be helpful, and then it blows up in your face. What's what Paul's going through? He's following Jesus, he's faithfully serving the Lord, he's faithfully sharing the gospel and writing God's word, and it ends up getting him persecuted, mistreated, and imprisoned. 
And he's telling us in verse 1, the reason I'm here and in this situation is because of Jesus. And then in verses 13 and 14, he's going to say, but I don't want you to be discouraged. I don't want you to lose heart because I'm suffering for your glory. I'm, I'm suffering for your good. God's going to work good things through this by bringing more and more people to faith in Jesus. So Paul is beginning and ending his argument by saying, here's what the gospel does for us, is that it gives us hope and encouragement and comfort even when things are not going the way we want them to go. Even if you're like Paul and you end up in prison or something tragic or hardship is facing you in life, he's saying, I don't want you to lose heart because Jesus is with you in all the circumstances, all the really good circumstances, with everything is going the exact way you want it in life. And he's writing from prison saying, but Jesus is still good even in these moments. And in between, he's going to explain why this can possibly be true. And the first thing that he does is he explains to us what the gospel is, all right? And so if you are unaware, the gospel means good news. And many of you have probably heard that before, are familiar with that, that that's what the word actually means. But I think we a lot of times forget it in either how we remind ourselves of God's good news for us or how we share it with the world. And so Paul is saying this in verse two, he's saying, assuming you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, in verse 3 and five, through 5, he's going to explain what the gospel is. He says, The mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations, as has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So what Paul is saying is, here's the gospel, is that the po holy prophets... In the Old Testament, had a glimpse of it. They had a foreshadowing of it. But it wasn't fully known. And the good news for Paul and the church and every Christian sense is that in Jesus, it's not a mystery anymore. We know what the good news is. We know how God feels about us. We know what God thinks of us as his children. And Paul's saying, here's the good news. The evidence is in Jesus Christ. So part of the good news of the gospel is that we actually know what it is. It is the redemption and forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. It's always the good news that God is for you, that God loves you and has redeemed you and forgiven you. And in our hearts, we always want to go, yeah, but well, how can I know that for sure? Right? If you've ever messed up, Sometimes we use the word sin, right? And you will struggle sometimes in your life to go, well, is it for me though? How do I know that the good news is actually good news? And that's why Paul says it's all about Christ. It's not about how you and I are doing or not doing. It's not about our performance. It's all about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. So in verse 6, he summarizes his whole point. This is the most important verse in this whole section. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So what Paul is explaining for you and I is that what the gospel is, is that it's God keeping his promise to you. Right? And it's a very, very old promise. That's why Paul says in ancient times, it was there. We just didn't know it fully. And by ancient times, he means all the way back to the beginning with Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis. Back then, Adam and Eve sinned, messed up, and made everything a disaster. <laughs> so if you've ever looked around and go, things should be better than this. Things are not going the way they should be. I think there's a, a better opportunity here. I think things should be better for people and the planet and everything else. The answer is, you're right. It should be. 
And when Adam and Eve sinned, and they brought all the brokenness and corruption into the world that we now suffer from, God's answer was to make a promise to them and to all humanity. And his promise was, one day I'm going to fix all of this. One day I'm going to heal all of it. One day I'm going to restore all of it. One day I'm going to redeem all of it, including you. And so from the very beginning of time, God makes this promise to his broken creation, to people like you and me who are stumbling along and getting some things right and some things wrong. He says, one day I'm going to heal it all. I'm going to fix it all. This is my promise to creation and to humanity. And what Paul is saying in verse 6 is that here is the gospel. Here's the good news of Jesus Christ. Is that Gentiles, meaning all people outside of Israel, all people that were not Jewish, all people that were viewed as being far from God, are now heirs of that promise. Another way of saying it is that Paul is saying every single person gets to enjoy that promise from God now. Every single person gets to receive that good news of Jesus Christ. So when you and I look at the world or our own lives and we are desiring something better, We are saying there needs to be more here. It it shouldn't be this broken. It shouldn't be this big of a struggle. You're absolutely right. That's what sin has done. It has crumbled everything around us. And the good news of Jesus, though, is that God has kept his promise. And that's what the gospel is. It's God keeping his promise to heal all things and redeem all things through Jesus Christ. The other reason verse 6 is so important is because it answers the question of who is this promise for? Who is the gospel for? Now, if you've been in church for a while, you're going to say the Sunday school answer, which is everybody. We love to say it's for everybody. But sometimes we forget just how extreme and radical that good news is. Because in the world that Paul was writing in, when he writes verse 6, is a world that says there are people who are close to God, there are people who are worthy of God, and of course God's going to keep his promises to them, of course God's going to do good things to them, because they're the right kind of people. They say the right prayers, they worship the right way, they are in their culture, they were born into the right families, and the right nation. And so the view at the time was, that's who God's promises are for. It's just this select group of people. And what Paul is saying in verse 6 is actually the good news of the gospel is so much bigger than that. It's for the Gentiles, which is their way of saying it's for everybody else. It's for all the people in the whole world, all the people that are close to God, all the people that are far from God, all the people that have been doing all the right rules and never made a mistake or appear to never make a mistake. And it's for all the people who are like Paul, terrible, horrible sinners that do everything wrong. And that's really good news. Here's our problem, and the problem for the world is a lot of times we don't present it as the good news that it really is. A lot of times the way we present it is the way that they did back then, which is there's some hoops you got to jump through. There's some certain behaviors you need to change. There's things you need to start doing and things you need to stop doing. And then the gospel will be for you. But what Paul is saying when he says, this is the mystery, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, right? Partakers in the promise, meaning he's saying, no, the good news of the gospel is so broad and so extreme that it is absolutely for everybody, including the pagan Gentiles, including the people that everybody has on their list of it not being for. And that's why it's called good news is because it's a message of hope and grace and mercy of God keeping his promises for every single human being on the planet. And Paul's saying that's what we're celebrating. 
Now, when Paul is talking about this, he uses his own story. In verse 7, he says, Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. And in verse 8, he says, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, grace was given to me. Now, here's the problem that we have with that, is that we're reading it like 2,000 years later after Paul has already written most of the New Testament, right? So everybody in this room, if you're a Christian, has a really good view of Paul, right? You, how many of you think you're a better Christian than St. Paul? Show a hand. Like, nobody. Everybody's like, nope, nope, nope. He's better than me. Look at all the miracles he did. Look at all the gospel work that he did. He wrote most of the New Testament. The reason I believe in Jesus is because of what Paul wrote. So he's better than me, Right? But what did Paul say? And this is not the only time he says this. He says, I'm the, I'm the worst of them. So if you asked Paul, guess what he would say? Actually, you are better than me. And he says this in other places too, where he says, I'm the worst sinner of all, and yet God still showed grace to me. Now here's why this is so amazing. Here's, I want you to understand <laughs> You got to take off your I love Paul glasses, right? And understand what he's saying. He's saying, I am the worst sinner. I am the worst Christian that you could possibly be. And yet, God gave me his grace. So if you've ever struggled like Paul with your walk with God and felt I kind of believe, but I'm not sure. I have a lot of doubts, or I don't think he actually likes me because I've done these things, and so I, I kind of go to church, and I sort of believe, but I haven't figured it all out yet. And you think, I'm not a very good Christian. Maybe God doesn't want me. He has use for other people, but not me. Paul's writing and saying here, no, actually, the gospel is for everyone, including you. God's grace and kindness is for you, even if you think you're competing with Paul right now about being the worst Christian ever. Now, here's why we struggle with this. Like I said, it's Paul, right? And you're like, he's a good guy. Like, I love Paul. So in Acts chapter 8, we see these stories of Paul beginning to persecute the church back when he went by the name Saul. And in Acts chapter 8 verse 3 it specifically says that Paul began to ravage or wreak havoc on the church and then it kind of talks about things that he did by ripping people out of their homes imprisoning them making sure they got stoned to death all these kinds of things now here's the deal with that we all love Paul the early church loved Paul the guy that wrote Acts was Luke one of his best friends so we're always trying to soften it right like, Paul's not that bad. Like, if you were to speak to me honestly right now, how many of you actually think in your heart of hearts, yeah, Paul really is the worst Christian ever? Even though he said it twice in the Bible, you're still like, no, no, thank you. No, I disagree, right? Because we want to soften it. So what we do in our English translations, we say, oh, yeah, he was, he was wreaking havoc. He was causing trouble on the church. Why? Because we like, okay, that was bad, but eventually we know he converts, right? And then he starts all these churches and writes the Bible, and we're like, yeah, see, he's not so bad. Why? Because we think he's made up for it. Like, see, look all, yeah, he did some bad stuff, but look at all the good things. And that's our struggle with the gospel, is we constantly think people got to make up for it. And so we love Paul. Why? Because he made up for it. What Paul is saying is, no, actually, I am the worst sinner. I am the lowest of all the saints. And the only reason that he is doing any good things, the only reason he says, this, I'm preaching to the Gentiles, I'm sharing the gospel with you. The only reason you and I have his letters in the Bible, he says, is because of God's grace in my life, not because I worked really hard and made it up to him. So Paul, the whole time, is saying, it's all by God's grace grace. I'm redeemed by God's grace. I'm sustained by God's grace. He's saying, I'm doing good things for the Lord because of God's grace in my life. I want to teach you why Paul writes this so many times. Like I said, in Acts chapter 8, especially in verse 3, it's, we kind of soften it in English. Of like, 
he was causing trouble for the church. We're like, oh, he's causing trouble. You know, he didn't like Christians, but then he changed, right? Well, the Greek word is limonio, and it's actually where we get the English word eliminate. So in Acts chapter 8, verse 3, when it says in English translations, he was causing trouble or he's wreaking havoc. The Greek word actually means eliminate. So Paul's actual goal was not just to, you know, get into a fight on Facebook with you, right? It wasn't just to cause some arguments and annoy the Christians. His actual goal was to eliminate them from the earth. Now, how many of you are like, that doesn't sound like Paul, right? <laughs> I see some of your faces like, that's not, that's not the Paul I know. Well, yeah, you know why that's not the Paul you know? Because verse 8 says, I'm the very least of saints, this grace was given to me. And here's why I bring it up, is Paul is trying to hammer home the point that the good news of the gospel, the good news that God keeps his promises to forgive and heal and redeem is absolutely for everybody. It's for the best Christian ever. And it's for people like Paul who think, I am the worst person. I am the worst Christian ever. And this is also what the gospel does in our lives. How we respond to it is it totally transforms us. That's why Paul is not that guy. That's why your response is, that's not the Paul I know. The Paul I know is all about Jesus and God's grace. And it's because of how the gospel works in our life, how we respond to it. So here's Paul, this terrible sinner who's hell-bent on eliminating Christians off the face of the planet. That's his goal. And then he meets Jesus. And he receives God's grace. And time and time again, Paul goes, I am the worst Christian. I am the worst sinner. And then he always has a comment. He says, and yet, God still gave me grace. And because of God's grace in my life, he now becomes the missionary Paul that we all know and love. The one who proclaimed the gospel, the good news to the Gentiles, to the people who were far from God and that nobody else wanted to bring the gospel to. So much so that you and I, and many other people on this planet are Christians because of what Paul said and wrote. So the answer becomes, how do we respond to the gospel is that we begin to share the good news that we have received, right? It's not a trick question. Right. And if you look at Paul's life, he's saying, it was, this grace was given to me for what? In verse 8, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. What Paul's saying is, here's how my life is different now. His main goal in life before Jesus was to destroy the church and eliminate Christians off the face of the planet. After he meets Jesus and receives God's grace, Paul has a whole new purpose for life. And his purpose becomes sharing the grace and the good news of Jesus with as many people as possible. And he also says, and I want it to be done in the church. He's saying, we should all be responding to God's good news of grace and forgiveness in Jesus by sharing it with as many people as possible. But it's really hard to share the gospel if you think you've earned it. If you think you have earned God's love, if you think you've earned God's grace, if you think you've earned salvation, if you think you've earned forgiveness, even just a small part of it, it'll be almost impossible for you to share the gospel. Because what you will end up sharing is not the good news that Jesus loves everybody. What you'll end up sharing with people is 
God might like you and he might love you if you do what I do, if you become like me. And the only thing that Paul says about himself in this passage is, I am the worst Christian ever. Why? Because Paul knows full well that he's only saved and redeemed and changed because of the grace of Jesus. So the reason Paul is able to respond to the gospel by becoming this amazing missionary that we know and love now is because he actually understood the extent of God's grace. He understood, I am the worst sinner ever, and now I'm the worst Christian ever, and yet God's grace is still abundant in my life. So if you and I actually believe that the gospel is the good news, that God, through Jesus, keeps his promise to the world to redeem, forgive, restore, and heal, then you and I will become like Paul, which is what his hope was in verse 10 when he says, so that through the church, more and more people would know the mystery and the wisdom of God, which is his way of saying the gospel. So the secret to us proclaiming the good news, which was Paul's secret, is simply this. I actually believe it's good news. That's it. Right? We, we get obsessed with strategies and programs and all kinds of other things. And Paul's answer is, well, here's how you become a missionary. You just believe that the gospel is actually the gospel. You simply believe that the good news is actually the good news. You believe that God's grace is actually God's grace. When I realize that, when I believe that, of course I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to want to share it with others and be like, did you know that Jesus is for you too? Did you know that, that Jesus has kept his promises to heal and forgive and redeem you? Right? A lot of times we stand in amazement at Paul's life, and it's an amazing life. You know who didn't stand in amazement at Paul's life? Paul. What he stood in amazement at was God's grace in his life. That's all he ever talked about. Read all of his letters. They repeat themselves a lot. It's just like, and so anyway, Jesus is really great. He loves you. He forgives you. It's all by God's grace. You can turn the page to the next book. And guess what Paul's going to say? Jesus is great. He loves you. He forgives you. It's all by God's grace. Because that's what he was obsessed with. Because he believed the fullness of the good news. So if you've ever been a person and a Christian sitting there wondering, I want to be more like Paul. Right? Ooh, good. Oh, you're like, man, guy did a lot of good for Jesus, right? Like personally, I believe in Jesus because I read a sentence in one of Paul's letters, and I was like, I'm in. So for me, I'm like, I love Paul. I think he's really great. But if you ever sat there and were like, I want to be a better Christian. I want to be more like Paul. I want to I do amazing things like him. Paul gives you the answer. He says, no, oh, here's the answer. Here's the secret to my life and to my ministry. Grace was given to me. Those are his words, not mine. He says in verse 8, this is why I'm doing it. Grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles. So here's the good news for you and I. Jesus has kept his promise to you to forgive you, to redeem you, and to save you from all of your sins. Here's the other good news. It's really actually for you. Martin Luther, obviously one of my heroes, said the most important two words to believe about the gospel are the words for you. We'll talk about the gospel, oh, God's grace. The gospel is good news that Jesus forgives sinners. And a lot of times we trap ourselves into thinking, yeah, but it was, it was for sinners like Paul. It's for sinners like them. It's, it's for the people that aren't so bad, right? But the good news of the gospel, and Luther's whole point is, no, here's what you need to believe about the gospel, is that it's actually for you. And here's the third part of the good news. 
of how you and I live differently and make a difference in the world in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces in the name of Jesus. So we follow the example of Paul, who we simply believe in the grace of God. Paul's response to the gospel is not, I'm going to work harder, I'm going to make it up to Jesus, I'm going to pay him back. Paul's response to the gospel was, wow, this is such good news. Other hurting, broken, sinful people need to know how much God loves them. So today, it might be you that needs to hear that. That as a broken, hurting, sinful person, the gospel of Jesus Christ is for you. On the other hand, you might be a person going, I already believe that. So go out and tell someone else and say, I have really good news for you. You don't have to work hard. You don't have to try harder. God already loves you. God has already kept his promises for you in Jesus Christ. God's grace is for you, just like it was for Paul, just like it was for me, just like it was for everybody else. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your abundant grace in our lives. That even when we feel or think that we are worse Christians and sinners than Paul, that your grace is always for us. And that through Jesus, you have kept your promises to forgive redeem and heal all things that are broken in this world may we be people that celebrate and rejoice so much and so loudly at that good news that the whole world hears about your love in jesus christ in your name we pray lord amen